So good to be with you on a beautiful Sunday morning. And uh, man, isn't that just a great way to start your day, worshiping the Lord? Amen? Amen. Nothing better than that. Alrighty, so we are in the book of Corinthians, and who likes fruit salad? Anybody fans of fruit salad? Fruit is good, but you want a little bit of everything, am I right? You want a little taste of everything, and this morning I want to declare before I even start that we're going to have a little scriptural fruit salad this morning. Um, There's a lot that's going on in the sermon today. I'm going to try my absolute best to tie it all together nicely, but we are diving into 1 Corinthians 13 and 14, and there's a whole bunch of stuff going on in these two chapters, but I believe that when we get to the end, it should all make sense as we tie it all together. What I am really excited about today is in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul is essentially going to answer the why question. What is the why question? Well, the why question is, why do we do what we do? I think that is probably one of the most important questions any of us can ask, especially when we find ourselves doing things repeatedly over a long period of time, especially when things are cultural or traditional or even part of what we've always done as a family. It is absolutely crucial that we are constantly going back to the why question Because if we're not careful, and if we don't know the purpose or the motivation or the heart behind what we're doing, then even living good things will become dead deeds. The why is important. Um, A couple of years ago, I remember hearing a story uh, about a lady who had a friend over for Thanksgiving, and she was so excited to have a friend over for Thanksgiving, and she proceeded to cook the turkey. And in the process of cooking the turkey, she removed the legs from the turkey. And her friend looked at her and said, wow, I've never seen that before. That's an interesting move. Why are you removing the legs from the turkey? And she said, well, the answer to the question that you're posing to me right now is my mom did it this way, and my grandma did it this way, and this is just the way we've always done it. And uh, this is the way we cook turkey as a family. And the guest kind of looked at her and said, well, that's the worst answer I've ever heard. But okay, I have no idea why you do what you do, but let's move on. A couple of years later or later on that year, she happened to bump into grandma again. And the first question she asked grandma was, grandma, I've got a question I've got to ask you. Why do you cut the legs off of the turkey for Thanksgiving? It's been driving me crazy. Why do we do this as a family? Grandma looked at her and said, my oven was too small. (laughs) So generations have been cutting legs off of turkeys because grandma's oven was too small. You see, when we don't ask the why question, we cut the legs off of underneath ourselves. Okay, so that's okay. It'll get better. It'll definitely get better. Hang in there. Um. So let's look at this, uh, 1 Corinthians 13. This is a portion of Scripture that you have heard probably at weddings, um, but this is Paul addressing the church, and listen to what he says. What is the why behind disciples? What is the why behind church? He says this, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 to 3, "For, for if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can actually move mountains, but I don't have love, then what am I? I am nothing. If I give all my possessions to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I might boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Eat that Shakespeare is what I say. That is just absolutely gorgeous, beautiful, the way Paul puts this. But Paul is really giving us the why. Why do we exist as a church? What is the purpose of us as disciples? And Paul lays it out so beautifully here for us this morning. He says it's about love. If we do all these great things, we have this impact in the community, and we come together on Sunday mornings, and we have these incredible spiritual experiences, and all these things are happening But if there isn't love, then what is the purpose behind anything that we're actually doing? 
Church, I want to tell you this morning, and, I'll, and I will fully confess this to you right now as a pastor. If you are not careful, you quickly find yourself in a place doing things that look good on the outside. But if there's no love, if your heart is not soft, if you're not humble before the Lord, if you're not surrendered to Him, quickly even things that look good on the outside become dead works. We've got to remain soft. We've got to remain in that place where ultimately everything we do is driven and guided by love. Let's see what Jesus has to say about this. Matthew 22, verses 34 to 39. And when the Pharisees had heard that Jesus had silent the Sadducees, they themselves gathered together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with a question. Teacher, which commandment is the greatest in the law? Jesus declared, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And I love this because I feel like Paul so beautifully, so eloquently tells us this morning that the purpose of the church is love. But that can be very broad, right? <laughs> that can be a very broad statement. What does he actually mean when he says that? Well, I believe Jesus brings clarity that when he says, what does it mean to love? It means to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. And it means to love your neighbor as yourself. That is why we gather together, church. That is why we are the church. It is to worship Him, to love Him, and to adore Him, and to glorify Him. And then secondly, it is to love our neighbors as ourselves. It is absolutely beautiful. John 13, 34 to 35, Jesus says this, A new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you also must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciple. How? If you love one another. <laughs> I, um, I love how Jesus brings it even more, he makes it even more clear for us this morning. The outside world should know us, they should identify us by the love we have for God and the love we have for one another. That is the purpose of church. That is the why of church. It is all about love. It is all about receiving the love from the Father and then responding to that love by loving the Father and by loving one another. That is what it's all about. Paul goes on, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 to 7. And this one you definitely know. This you've heard at weddings before. But I love this. We are now going to really hone in on what is love. What is love? Baby, don't hurt me. No more. <laughs> First Corinthians 13, 4 to 7. Love is patient. Oh, okay. <laughs> Rough start. <laughs> Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. I love how we are being told you what love actually is. We are being given such a beautiful picture of the definition of love here, and it's actually very challenging to all of us, no matter where we are. <laughs> Uh, some of us in this place uh, believe that love means everybody should do what they want to do. That's what love is. Well, Paul challenges that. He says, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love does not simply say that everybody should be able to do what they need to do. Love is all about truth. But then at the same time, Paul says, love is kind and love is patient. You should not treat those who are not living according to the truth as if they were garbage. You should love them. You should pray for them. You should be kind to them. You should have patience with them. This is absolutely beautiful, and it really challenges all of us across multiple different spheres. L love really is the way we treat others. Love is selfless. It is not selfish. 
Love is God's blueprint for relationship with people. What I really want you to see here is that Christianity in its core is actually extremely outward motivated. Isn't it incredible that Paul is saying to us here that the whole purpose, the whole goal of discipleship is to love God, honor God, fear God, and then to love others the way you love yourself. You see, the world will tell you that it's all about you. We're living in a culture where it's all about you. It's all about your wants. It's all about your desires. It's all about your wisdom. It's all about you. It's about numero uno. It's about number one. You've got to do whatever you need to do to get yourself ahead, to protect yourself. That is what the world is all about. Christianity, like we've said so many times in this series, is countercultural in that it's all about the outward. So the first thing I would say about that is, is we are called to find wisdom from God who is outside of us. We find wisdom from Him. The world will tell you that if you simply seek your heart for long enough, you will find wisdom. The Bible actually says that the human heart is exceedingly wicked. <laughs> it will deceive you. We find wisdom from the Lord. That's where we find wisdom. The world will tell you that you've got to love yourself and you've got to take care of yourself. The Bible says that we've got to selflessly love others and lay down our lives for others. It's completely upside down. I don't know if you watch Stranger Things, but it is the upside down. Christianity is the upside down. It looks different to anything you've experienced or seen in the world. The church is called to reflect God's love. So here's where we're going to move on in the sermon today, and we're going to get a little bit practical. So step number one is, is I need you to understand that it's all about love, and it's all about reaching others. That's what it's about. It's about loving God and loving others. Now Paul is going to shift gears, and he's going to go into something that is very, very practical when it comes to the church. 1 Corinthians 14, verses 1 to 5. And let me just say this, as a preacher, I was extremely tempted in the week to just live in 1 Corinthians 13. I was like, let's just love, love, love. But we got to get to some other things as well. So 1 Corinthians 14, verses 1 to 5, he says this, follow the way of love, okay, and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit. I'm going to come back to that sentence, but that sentence in and of itself is an extremely interesting sentence. We've been speaking about love, and the first thing Paul does is, is he practically takes that to spiritual gifts. He says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They, the utter, they utter mysteries by the Spirit. But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be edified. Pause the movie right there. We have got lots of things we need to dig into this morning, and we've got lots of important questions that we need to answer. And what I love about this series is, is it gives me the opportunity to get up here on a Sunday morning and to clarify to you how we as a church interpret what the Bible actually has to say to us. So the first thing I want to say about this portion of Scripture is Paul actually tells us that we should desire the gifts of the Spirit. I want to tell you that I think in 2023 in the United States of America, we have become so scientific, we have become so practical, we have become so smart that I think we feel uncomfortable when it comes to things of the Spirit. I think there is at times this desire to push away anything that is supernatural and to push away anything that is spiritual. We want to make everything a practical issue that can be solved with a board meeting, a brainstorming meeting, strategy, planning. But I want to tell you this morning that that is not fully accurate. There is a spiritual realm, there is the Holy Spirit, and then there are the gifts of the Spirit, and God will use His Spirit 
to build the church. The church is ultimately a spiritual house, and that has not changed in 2023. That is still the same today as it's always been. Now, I think the, 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 the thing that we need to understand is this. It is important for us as the church to make sure that we find balance in these things, and that is exactly what Paul is talking about this morning. Just because we believe in the spiritual gifts, that does not mean that chaos and disorder is okay. We've got to be orderly, and we've got to be clear, but at the same time, we've got to humble ourselves and be open to the move of the Spirit. So one of the questions that I will get very often from people is, what do you guys believe as a church regarding the spiritual gifts? Do you believe in the gifts of the Spirit? <laughs> And I feel like sometimes people are wanting to know if I'm going to say yes or no. The answer is yes, absolutely. We believe in the gifts of the Spirit. But here is what I want you to know, and this is what I want you to understand. I believe, and we believe as a church, that the gifts of the Spirit will manifest themselves. They will not be manufactured by us. I'm telling you now, I've seen too much to not believe in the gifts of the Spirit. I've seen too much in my own life. I've seen too much in church. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a couple of stories. I remember one Sunday I was in a youth meeting, and uh, there's about a thousand kids in the room, and we're busy worshiping. And I'm on the stage, and I'm just busy praying, and I'm busy worshiping, and I'm just—I mean, I'm just experiencing the presence of the Holy Spirit. And as I'm on the platform, I just all of a sudden in my mind I have this picture of the Holy Spirit moving like a wind but literally moving from the left side of the room to the right side of the room. I know this is weird. I know this is strange. I'm even weirder in private, believe me, <laughs> right? But as I'm standing there, I just get the sense of this is what the Holy Spirit's doing, and I don't even fully comprehend what's going on. I open up my eyes, and I start seeing people fall over this way. Shoom, 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 all over the room. People just falling over that way. I did not speak a word. I didn't say a word to anybody. Um, I remember there was a time when we were sort of on tour with the band, and the band had a certain set list that they were doing, and I had a certain message that I was preaching on this particular tour, and I'll never forget, we got to our last stop on the tour back home, and I'm sitting in the front row, and I'm busy worshiping, and um, as I'm sitting there, I just feel the Holy Spirit impress in my heart that I, I need to do a different message this time tonight. Um, and the message I felt like he had to, that I did, it was called The Secret Place. That was the title of my message. I hadn't done it once on the tour, not one time. I had done it like a year previously. I had done one message the whole tour at each stop. I'm sitting there, and I just feel in my heart that this is what I need to do. I get onto the stage. I get ready to start ministering. The worship leader walks off the platform. He gets to about yeah. He turns around. He comes back to me, and he whispers into my ear, The Secret Place. <laughs> What is that? <laughs> How do you explain that? So on the one hand, you cannot deny the gifts of the Spirit, the power of the Spirit. On the other hand, I must tell you that I've seen it be manipulated, and I've seen it be misused, and I've seen it be manufactured. And when we start doing it in the flesh, we are quickly going to find ourselves in trouble because that's when it becomes, in my opinion, very deceitful and very unholy. You see, what I've seen during my time is there'll be these moments where the Holy Spirit will come sovereignly and move in a powerful way. And then what we do as people is we go, I want to bottle this. <laughs> How do I catch this? I want to catch the fireflies. I want to catch it. I want to put it in a bottle. I want to put it in my back pocket. And then when I want to impress people, I want to take it out. I want to shake it a little bit and I want to release it. Doesn't work that way. So when we say we believe in the Holy Spirit, in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We believe in being open to the move of the Holy Spirit, but we do not believe that we can manufacture or make it happen. I heard somebody say it this way, um, I can, I can um, hoist the sails, but I cannot make the wind blow. <laughs> and that's really what we do on Sunday mornings. We hoist the sails in an expectation that the Holy Spirit will move but we cannot make the wind blow. So on the one hand, I feel like we get this sort of rejection of anything supernatural in the Holy Spirit. On the other hand, we get this over-spiritualized view on things in life, where we just over-spiritualize everything. I remember uh, a couple of years ago, 
One of my daughters did not do particularly well in a test. They came home and they said to me, Dad, just didn't do well in the test. I'm like, okay, honey, well, that's probably my genes that's floating through to you. And she goes, the devil's just out to get me. You know, that, that old devil. And I'm like, oh, okay, hang on. Stop right there. <laughs> I was with you all the way to the devil part. Let me ask you this. How attentive have you been in class? Well, honestly, I don't like the teacher or the subjects. They're not attentive at all. Let me ask you this next question. How hard did you actually study for this test? Well, Dad, honestly, didn't study at all. So here's the deal. You flunked the test because you didn't do your part of the work practically. You did not flunk the test because the devil's a bad guy. Now, let me say this to you. The devil is a bad guy. But I do think sometimes the devil sits and goes, wow, they are giving me credit from everywhere. <laughs> Too many accolades. I've got to leave. <laughs> devil's like, I didn't do half the stuff that you're doing to yourself, pal. <laughs> so it's important that we find that balance when it comes to what it means to be spiritual and what it means to desire the gifts of the Spirit. So Paul moves on here and he talks specifically about two things, and I want to touch on both of the things that he is speaking about. The first thing he is speaking about is prophecy, and then he speaks about tongues, and I want to speak a little bit about both of these this morning. So the question is, first question I want to answer is, what is prophecy in the New Testament You'd think this would be a fairly easy question to answer, but I'm going to assure you and tell you that in my research in the week, <laughs> not an easy question to answer. This can actually become a topic that becomes very, everybody has a take on it, and yeah, it can get a little hairy, but here it is. This is what I believe is a well, um, this is a good sort of understanding of what prophecy is in the, in the New Testament. It is a special revelation of truth spoken through men inspired by the Spirit. Prophecy is a special revelation of God's truth spoken through men inspired by the Spirit. One of the reasons it is important to emphasize that prophecy is spoken through men is because men are what? Men are fallible. Men know in part and prophesy in part. So because God uses people there are moments where things aren't always perfect. In the same way God will use a preacher to preach the good news of the gospel, God still needs to use this filter, and this filter is very problematic at times. So we've got to understand that. So the Holy Spirit doesn't make mistakes, but the Holy Spirit is using flawed people. I believe that there are two ways that we will experience prophecy in our time in the New Testament. The first one is, it is a form of gospel exhortation. It is when the gospel is exhorted, it is when the gospel is proclaimed, it is when the gospel is preached. Prophecy will take on the form of a revelation, a special revelation connected to a specific people at a specific time in regards to what Jesus has done and in regards to what Jesus will do. Um, I think a really good example of this is, I'll never forget, I was preaching in a place one time, and I was sort of getting ready to preach my sermon, and I was just sitting there, and I was praying, and so on and so forth, and then a man got up out of the congregation, he came to the front, he sort of spoke to some of the elders on the side, and he had a word from the Lord, so they allowed him to come on the stage, he grabbed the mic, he literally proceeded to quote my main scripture, <laughs> The, the, my main scripture, the, the, the one I was going to use, he read out to the congregation, and then he literally went on to essentially take my core point and say it to the congregation in a different way. You know those moments where you just, you're upset with the Holy Spirit, you're like, spoiler alert. <laughs> Could you not have kept that for later? He's using my best material. He had no idea, I didn't, he had no idea what I was going to do and what I was not going to do. So for me, in that moment, that is a good example of it's a proclamation of the gospel, but to a specific group at a specific time, that is prophecy. Another way that we will see prophecy is we will see prophecy in specific situations related to specific people. Um, there will be times where by the gift of the Holy Spirit, 
the Holy Spirit will make known to people specifics surrounding their situation. Um, a good example of this is when a man named Agabus prophesied that Paul would be arrested and that there would be a famine in the book of Acts. You can go check that out. He actually prophesies accurately around what is going to happen. I've had this happen in my life once or twice. Um, I'll never forget there was a time where Linda and I were just in a season where it was just a financially very difficult season. We were trying to figure out our lives. We weren't sure what the next steps were. We were just sort of in the wilderness. That's what we called it. Um, we were in the wilderness, and we were there for a while. But during this time, there was a church that actually financially supported us. They loved us. They believed in us. Um, so they actually sowed a seed into our lives for a period of time whilst we were essentially in this wilderness. And I'll never forget, um, we were actually in a Panera Bread, and Linda got the email from this church that they would no longer support us anymore. They just felt like the time was up. They felt like they had done what the Lord had told them to do in obedience. And um, I'll never forget, Linda read this email, and she looked up at me. She's sort of teary-eyed, and she was like, I don't know what happens now, because that was, I mean, we've just got no prospects. We, we don't know where we're going. Um, it just feels like a mess. With this not being there, I don't know where that leaves us. And I can't explain this to you. I really can't. I'm not this smart. I'm not this clever. I just, in that moment, as she says it to me, I just had this unbelievable peace and joy and calm of the Holy Spirit. And without flinching, I said to her, if God's provision is coming to an end in this season, it means that the door to the next season is about to open up. I, I said it, and as I said it, she's like, whoa, who's this guy? That's not my husband. I'm like, I know, baby, that's the Holy Spirit, right? I, I don't even know where it came from. It's just like, whoop, it went out. I was like, that is so good. Can I just be wise like that always? Um, and I'm telling you now, in the next like two weeks, a whole bunch of supernatural stuff happened and God opened up the door for our next season. Um, it's just, I knew it, that I knew it, that I knew it in my bones. So that really is the gift of prophecy and that is how it works. But again, let me be clear, it is a gift of the Holy Spirit. It is not something that we can manufacture or we can produce. And I've heard stories of, of people that God will use them in that gifting, but then what happens is, is people will go back to them and go, hey, so can you tell me, I, I need you to almost fortune teller my life. You once prayed over me at a meeting, and you were so accurate, and it was so clinical that now I'm in a mess, and I want you, I want you to over lunch here at Chipotle. Quickly do the thing that you do. Quickly tell me. And if we're not careful, we feel pressure in that moment to perform, and then we come up with stuff. And that's what I mean by manufacturing things, and that's when it can get dangerous, and that's when it's not good. So that is essentially what the gift of prophecy is all about. It's a supernatural gift. Um, okay, Paul goes on, and he speaks about tongues. So let's talk about tongues for a minute. What does that mean? And uh, a couple of things that we need to say about it. Um, there's essentially three manifestations, I believe, of the gift of tongues. The first one is this, tongues as an actual foreign language. There will be times where the Holy Spirit will empower you to actually speak a foreign language. Ek kan Afrikaans praat, ek kan eindelijk een ander taal praat. Ek het die gift of tongues. Um, that was not tongues, that was Afrikaans. <laughs> I am Afrikaans. <laughs> I speak two languages. I know I'm more intelligent than I look. Um, but there are times that the Holy Spirit, through the gift of tongues, will actually empower you in order to um, evangelize. He will give you the ability to speak a foreign language. Um, listen to this. Acts 2, verses 4 to 13. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. What, what's kind of cool, little Easter egg, and I'm watching the time there, I'm not going to get carried away, but little Easter egg with this, is you remember the Tower of Babel, men tried to get to God in their own strength, and, men then divide, and God then divides men by giving them different languages. Remember that in the Old Testament? Here we are in the moment of Acts, and God builds the church by giving the Holy Spirit, and now what He does is He doesn't remove their speech, but He actually gives them tongues of fire, and this is what happens. So it's beautiful. There's a beautiful mirror between what God did and what He's doing now. 
Listen to this. Now they were staying, they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. So the disciples are in the room. The Holy Spirit comes on the disciples. They start speaking in other tongues. Now, all of a sudden, people from all over the place with different languages all understand the good news of the gospel because of what's going on. Uh, Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Uh, Parisians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, uh, Cappadocia, Lord, can you just give me the gift of reading? That'd be awesome. Uh, Pontus, (laughs) Asia, uh, goes on and on and on, and parts of Libya, um, visitors from Rome, Cretans, Arabs. um, We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. That is such a weird statement. Normally when someone has too much wine, you don't understand what they're saying, not the opposite. I, um, I actually heard such a cool story of, uh, of somebody that got up in a church, and uh, essentially they got up and they, they spoke in tongues, and essentially everybody heard them speak in tongues, but it sounded like a language they could not understand, like the Afrikaans I was speaking a little bit earlier. And then after the service, they had a man come up to them absolutely in tears, Um, And he was a Chinese man, and he essentially said that in the moment she was speaking in tongues, she was saying perfectly in Mandarin, come over and help us, please come over and help us, come help us know the way of salvation. And he was busy praying at that time about potentially going back to his homeland to preach the gospel, right? So incredible, incredible, incredible. So that's the first manifestation of speaking in tongues. The second one is this, tongues as a prayer language. This is very different to the first manifestation of the gift because this language is not a human language. It is the Spirit praying through you. Uh, What does that mean, Pastor Mark? Well, let me try to tell you. 1 Corinthians 14 verses 2. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. Okay, so the second kind of tongue we get is a kind of tongue that is a prayer language, and no one understands this language except the Holy Spirit in you and the Lord. So a really good logical question would be, why on earth would I ever do this? <laughs> Romans eight twenty six. In the same way, The Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. So in our prayer time specifically, when we have the gift of speaking in tongues and praying in the Spirit, really what is taking place is is the Holy Spirit is praying through you to the Father And it's praying even things that you don't know that you should be praying, even things that you don't understand. So it is literally a spiritual prayer language. Last one, third manifestation of tongues. So the first one was a foreign language. The second one was um, a prayer language. And then the third one is this, tongues with interpretation. This is when somebody speaks in a heavenly language in a congregational setting And then somebody comes and interprets what is being said. The Spirit speaks through one person, and then the Spirit interprets what was said through another person. So in other words, what this would look like in real time is someone would come up and they would speak in tongues, and we would not understand what was being said because it is like a heavenly language. After that has taken place, somebody will come up and literally interpret what has been said. So while that person was being given the gift of tongues, another person was given the gift of interpretation. So that is how it works. So it is very much like prophecy, but it is like prophecy through tongues. Now, let's move on here. Let me show you what Paul goes on to say. Now that you understand a little bit about prophecy and a little bit about tongues, 
1 Corinthians 14, 26 to 28. What then shall we say, brothers and sisters? When you come together, each of you as a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue or an interpretation, everything must be done so that the church may be built up. I want you to understand this. Paul said, number one, remember, 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, why are we in existence? It is to love God and to love others. Now Paul is saying that everything that is done should be done in such a way that the church is built up. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two or at most three should speak, one at a time, and someone must interpret. If there is no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet. (laughs) in the church, I love this, and speak to himself and to God. (laughs) So what Paul is saying is, is listen, this gifts of the Spirit is good. We should desire the gifts of the Spirit, but every gift has its own function and has its own purpose. And it's important that when we come together as the church, that there is clarity. It is important that there is order. It is important that we understand what is going on. So Paul is saying, if you want to grab the microphone on a Sunday morning and just make a whole bunch of noise and nobody understands what you're saying and nobody gets what's going on, I would rather you sit down and be quiet (laughs) and keep your thoughts to yourself because you're not edifying the church and you're not loving everybody. I love this. So what Paul is really saying here is he's saying that in a public setting, if tongues is going to happen as a spiritual gift, There needs to be the interpretation. Why? Because it is important that the church understands what's going on. God is a God of love. God is a God of clarity. God is a God of order. Listen to what he goes on to say here. 1 Corinthians 14, 9 to 12. So is it with you, unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you're saying? You will just be speaking into the air. (laughs) Um, why do I feel like he's addressing me kind of a little bit? Um, (laughs) Undoubtedly, there are all sorts of languages in the world, yet none of them without meaning. If then I do not grasp the meaning of what someone is saying, I am a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker is a foreigner to me. So it is with you, since you are eager for the gifts of the Spirit, try to excel in those that build up the church. And I think the message that we need to take out of this this morning, the the heartbeat of this whole thing is this. Paul says that we are called to be a loving church, and then at the same time he says that it is absolutely critical that when we get together, we do things in a way where everybody understands and relates to what is actually going on. So here it is this morning. If you had to summarize my message in in one sentence, it's this. A loving church is a church that communicates in a way that is clear, orderly, and understandable. That is what love looks like. A loving church is a church that communicates in a way that is clear, orderly, and understandable. It does not matter how spiritual you think it is. If what we are doing is not relatable and understandable, it is unedifying. If it is unedifying, it is unloving. Paul is speaking specifically about spiritual gifts, but I think this principle relates to more than just that. If our own personal preferences and traditions make us unrelatable to the community and the generation we are trying to serve, we are in serious trouble, right? It is important that we understand this morning that connected to the love of God is clarity. I believe with all my heart this morning as I stand here that every generation speaks a language. Every generation speaks a language. As time goes on and as things evolve, um, times change. Now, let me say this. God's truth never changes. I'm the same today, yesterday, and forever. It never, ever changes. It doesn't matter how unpopular it is or how serious it is or how uncomfortable it makes you feel. God's truth never changes. But the way we communicate to a lost and a hurting and a dying world has to change in order for us to be relatable, 
in order for us to actually reach an understanding with people. I love how Paul says, it doesn't matter if it comes across as super spiritual. If it's not actually reaching people, it is unloving, it is unedifying. It is important for us to understand that this morning. I love, uh, we, we know this portion of Scripture, John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he sent Jesus. The Bible then actually goes on to say that Jesus is the visible expression of the invisible God. God loved us so much that he made himself visible in Christ, right? He makes himself known in Jesus And that is why it is so important for us as a church to understand that we are called to communicate in such a way that actually reaches the community that we are called to reach. Um, There are two ways, there are two things I want to touch on here, and then we're going to close the service today. But the first one is preaching. It's important that we preach a gospel message that is centered on the truth, that is uncompromising. But at the same time, it's important that we preach a gospel message that is understandable. I want to say to you this morning, and I say this all the time, if you have been in this church for a while, there might come a point where if you want to be discipled more and deeper, you need to join a Bible study. You need to join a small group. You need to put yourself in a place where you can actually theologically dive into deeper things. On a Sunday morning, we are called to preach the truth, but we are called to preach the truth to everybody from the person that's been a Christian to 50 years to the person that's never heard the gospel in their lives. We need to make sure we are communicating in a language that everybody in the room actually understands. That's the first one, preaching. Second one is worship. Worship can very quickly become a very contentious issue in the church. (laughs) Man, I'm sweating just thinking about this, right? Just worship is personal. Worship touches us in a way that is so just integral. And every single one of us sitting in this room have had different experiences, different times, different styles. There was a moment you got saved and you got rescued. At that time, there was worship music that you identify with very personally. So every one of us come from different places and different stages. So the question is, what should worship look like? Should it be super traditional? Should it be contemporary? What should it look like? I believe that worship should be the language of the generation or the culture that we're actually trying to reach. Doesn't matter how spiritual it feels or it sounds, if nobody understands it and it doesn't reach anybody, it is important that we make sure that we do what we do. And that is why we do what we do. Um, It is interesting to note that Luther, uh, Martin Luther, would actually take bar songs. He would take popular bar songs and he would change the lyrics and he would sing those songs so that people would understand the gospel. That is like me getting up here and going, shake it off, shake it off. Don't be caught by sin. Dun, 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 dun. Shake it off. Okay, that was awful. No one would come to church ever. But the reality is, is this. Even your most beloved hymn was the most contemporary song at the time when the song came out. Organs. At the time, the church used organs. Was the electric guitar at the time. We went to a cathedral when we were in Cape Town, and I remember walking into this, and it's the high ceilings, and it's this incredible architecture, and it's the stained glass windows. It was the marvel of architecture and uh, and ingenuity at the time. It was the most modern thing there was. And then I think sometimes we get bent out of shape because we're like, what is that projector up there? Is that a projector? We should not have projectors. Well, it's the stained glass window of 2023, ladies and gentlemen. (laughs) <laughs> I want to close by this I want to close off by saying this this morning I remember my pastor in South Africa always used to say that the church is the only organization in the world that exists for its non-members <laughs> we've got to keep that in mind we've got to keep in mind that ultimately everything we do we're called to come together and to love God with everything we have but we are called to reach the lost and the hurting and the broken, and we need to be open to that. Matthew 5, stand with me as I close by reading this. Matthew 5, verses 14 to 16. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light up a lamp and put it under a bowl. 
Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So Father, this morning, I want to thank you so much that you are a personal God. You are a God that reaches us on a personal level. I thank you, Lord, this morning that we can relate to you. We can, we can come to you with our weaknesses, with our, our wants and our needs and our desires, Lord. But Father, I thank you also this morning that we are called together on a mission, in a purpose, to reach a lost and a dying and a hurting world that is far from you. So Father, I thank you this morning for the message that is eternal. I thank you for a message that never changes. I thank you, Lord, that you will empower us and equip us to preach that message in all of its glory and in all of its truth. At the same time, Father, give us discernment, give us wisdom, give us the grace to speak in a language that the culture understands. So, Father, I thank you this morning for this church. I thank you, Lord, that you will help us to really walk in love in everything that we do. We love you, Father. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen and amen.